Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. I hope your chess conference is going well. My name is uh, Faraz Jaffer. I'm a ICU doc out of private practice in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, it's my great opportunity to introduce you to a very bright uh, panel here. They've all done some research on um, management of bacterial diseases. Uh, today we're going to learn about plural diagnosis of TB. We're going to have some outcomes-based research as well as attitudes towards vaccinations. Uh, I'm going to quickly just uh, set expectations for the session. Each uh, presenter is going to get eight minutes to present their data, and then at the end of the session, we'll open it up for questions. So please hold your um, questions for the end of the session. Uh, and let's get started. So first up is Dr. Youssef, and we'll proceed from there. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mubarak Yusuf. Mubarak, me, Mubarak means uh, blessing, so I feel blessed to be here today. <laughs> so uh, the topic of my presentation today is, um, is the presence of iron deficiency anemia, a poor prognostic factor in hospitalization for bacterial pneumonia. So this is an analysis using the national inpatient sample. Just a little bit of background about this. Iron deficiency anemia, as we all know, is the most common uh, nutritional deficiency worldwide. Uh, several studies have, have uh, identified the essential role of iron in the survival and growth of pathogenic organism. So we aim to investigate the impact of iron deficiency anemia in an acute bacterial infection, such, such as uh, bacterial pneumonia. So our study designs a retrospective observational study. We use the National Inpatient Sample 2016 to 2019. Uh, our inclusion criteria is any admission with a principal diagnosis of bacterial pneumonia using the ICD-10 code with previously validated study um, the IC, uh, the, with the age greater than or eight, 18 and above. Our exclusion criteria is any patient that is not admitted with a principal diagnosis of uh, uh, bacterial pneumonia and if the age is less than 18. The outcome we sought to measure, measure is the uh, primary outcome of mortality and secondary outcome includes septic shock, acute respiratory failure, cardiac arrest, mean length of hospital stay, and uh, total hospital charge. This is a schematic representation of the study design. Uh, over the period of 20, 2016 to 2019, we had about 142 million discharge from uh, the hospital. And, uh, uh, using our inclusion criteria, we are able to have 450 452,000 patients with bacterial pneumonia. So we divided them into two cohorts using uh, patients with uh, iron deficiency anemia and those without iron deficiency anemia. This is the baseline characteristics of our patient. The age, uh, even uh, they're about almost the same age, uh, average age. We also noticed that uh, the racial distribution was also evenly distributed. Um, of, of important to note is that patients with iron deficiency anemia actually had higher comorbidity using the elixir comorbidity index. So um, outcome that we measured include mortality. As we noticed here that when we did the crude mortality, we had a percentage higher mortality in patients with iron deficiency anemia, 3.25%. And in non-iron deficiency anemia, we have 2.87. But when we adjusted for uh, likely um, co-founders using the multivariate uh, regression, uh, we noticed that there was actually a decreased odds of mortality in patients with iron deficiency anemia compared to those that are not iron deficient, and this is, which is statistically significant. Also, for other outcome measured, measured also, which included acute respiratory failure, cardiac arrest, septic shock, we also note a similar trend, that is there's a, a lesser odds of acute respiratory failure, cardiac arrest, septic shock. Um, acute kidney injury though, there was higher percentage of patients with iron deficiency anemia having acute kidney injury, but there was no really statistical significant difference. The mean length of hospital stay, there was about uh, 0.32 mean difference between uh, both cohort. And the total hospital charge also, there was like about $402.5 mean difference. Uh, so this is like a summary table of the uh, outcome. So in conclusion, we noticed that there was patients that are admitted for bacterial pneumonia with iron deficiency anemia, there was actually uh, 
less there's actually um, they did not have a worst outcome. That is, they had better outcome in terms of mortality, septic shock, acute respiratory failure, and also cardiac arrest. This finding may suggest that there's a protective impact of iron deficiency anemia and bacterial pneumonia. This is a, a correlation, really doesn't mean there's a causation. That is, uh, the, the, the reason why they have the protective effect is the iron deficiency anemia. So we really need to see more research to uh, investigate deeper if this actually, because this, to best of our knowledge, this is like the first study that is showing this association between patients with iron deficiency anemia and bacterial pneumonia. So the take home message, which is actually like a question to the clinician is that, should you consider a delay in treatment in patient with iron deficiency anemia with or without uh, a patient with iron deficiency anemia in bacterial pneumonia? Should you consider a delayed treatment if they're not symptomatic? So pretty much that's the summary of, uh, that's the take home message for the clinician here. Thank you very much. Apparently this doesn't want to stay for short people, so there we go. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Felzer. Um, I am a pulmonary critical care fellow at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, provider assessment of practice and perspectives in respiratory vaccinations in southeastern Minnesota. I have nothing to disclose. I did receive some funding um, for this project. So um, the reason I'm going to be talking to you all about vaccinations today is because um, the uh, factors influencing vaccine uptake are quite varied, and the understanding, and especially in the adult population, is very limited. There's been a significant amount of research performed in this field in the pediatric um, population, but not as much done in adults. Um, our high-risk adults, which are typically considered adults age 18 to 64 with pre-existing conditions, either immunocompetent or immunocompromised, are highly under-vaccinated. We've seen that in all sorts of vaccinations. Um, and among adults, uh, there's significant vaccine hesitancy, primarily in influenza vaccine, followed by HPV vaccine, and then pneumococcal vaccine. And multiple studies have shown that uh, providers can make a significant impact on the um, vaccinations that their patients receive. And patients often cite uh, provider recommendations as a top reason for why they received a vaccination. Um, in 2019, WHO declared vaccine hesitancy a top 10 global threat because so many people were either delaying or not obtaining their vaccinations. So what we did was we did a web-based survey um, examining vaccine uptake, refusals, and disparities. The survey was of the providers because we figured that we would be able to get a higher response rate of providers rather than patients themselves. And the providers that we targeted were primary care providers that were physicians and advanced practice providers in adult primary care, pulmonology, and geriatrics in southeastern Minnesota. They were contacted over three times uh, over three months, and this was performed between October and December of 2021. So we received about a 30% response rate, which these days in survey world is not too bad. Um, and um, we found one of the most significant things was that almost all of the patients, or sorry, all the providers talked to their patients about um, high risk, uh, their high risk patients about respiratory vaccination. So 100% of them talked to their patients about COVID vaccination. And then you can see 92% talked to their patients about influenza and 87% about pneumococcal vaccines. So we wanted to try to elicit the barriers uh, that p providers felt were barriers to discussing the influenza vaccine, and that's primarily what the survey focused on was around influenza vaccines. And so um, the, if you look from left to right, um, you can see that the major barriers are the ones that we focused on. And so lack of time and other health issues taking precedent over the vaccine discussions were the primary reasons why providers felt that they didn't have time or felt like they couldn't talk to their patients about about vaccinations. Um, the other significant thing was that they often felt like once someone made up their mind about a vaccination that they weren't going to be able to change their mind. So um, the reasons that they felt patients refused vaccinations were that 
patients felt like the flu would make them sick or that the flu, cause, uh, the flu vaccine causes the flu. I'm sure we've all heard this in our daily practice and out in the community. The other significant part was that people felt like influenza was maybe not severe enough to warrant a flu vaccine, that they were, they were just getting the flu and it no, was no big deal. So what were some of the strategies that providers used to try to um, convince their patients that they needed to get vaccinated for flu? Um, and so in the right-hand column, you'll see the often or always. These are strategies that people would use or sometimes. And so most of these um, were well over 50%. And so the most um, important thing that providers did was stating that they felt it was safer to vaccinate a patient rather than to not be vaccinated, and then discussing the efficacy of a vaccine as well as the risks of morbidity and mortality. The other thing was we looked at herd immunity community, um, both as, at the local level of their kind of um, uh, local family, friends, people that had high-risk conditions, as well as actual herd immunity. And more people uh, felt that it resonated with them if it was their, their close-knit circle rather than herd immunity, which was too broad for most people to understand. So um, although providers used a lot of these different strategies, um, they didn't feel that a lot of these strategies were actually effective, which is quite unfortunate. And so you can see that things shift into the somewhat effective area. Um, and so for the most part, all these strategies that were used were only somewhat effective. Uh, so over half of our providers um, reported that they were using an immunization information system. So these are often statewide registries. And so the important thing about that is that they capture data from our pharmacies, our provider offices, our hospitals, um, any other place that vaccines are administered, even in the workplace. And so that's important because then anywhere someone goes within the state, that vaccine information is captured. And so uh, at least a majority of people used this in their uh, electronic medical record. Um, again, a majority and a much higher majority of the providers uh, reported that they were using an alert when a patient hadn't received their vaccinations. And then some of those people that uh, reported they received an alert then sent a reminder to their patients that, hey, you're due for your annual influenza vaccine or you're due for your pneumococcal vaccine. Again, most of this data that we looked at was in the influenza vaccines. Um, so again, uh, discussions by providers are really an important factor in encouraging people to become vaccinated. But to aid in that communication, you can use alerts, um, both for the provider to talk about it with their patients at each appointment or to send them um, an alert via the electronic medical system. Most of our EMRs now have online patient portals, and so that's an important tool that we need to tap into. Um, but then we also need to make sure that there's good vaccine access, and this gets into a whole other topic, but making Making sure that we have vaccine clinics that are available outside that nine to five, you know, business hours when a lot of people are working, have them available at the workplaces, have them available on lunch breaks, have mobile vaccine clinics. There's a lot of things that we can do to increase vaccine uptake. Um, obviously, insurance can also play a role. Um, influenza vaccines are primarily covered by almost every insurance, um, as are pneumococcal, but uh, there are some other vaccinations uh, such as shingles or other vaccines that are not always covered by every commercial insurance. Um, so overall, providers, you guys can have a really strong impact on encouraging your patients to get vaccinated. And there are many barriers, and we all recognize that, but it does seem like most providers are actually having these conversations, whether or not they're as efficacious as we would like, still to be determined. Use vaccine um, uh, written in electronic alerts um, and try to convince your patients that it's better to get a vaccine. So with that, I will conclude and take any questions after. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Asad. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Staten Island University Hospital. Thank you for having me here today. I will be presenting our study correlating the PPI use to the development of uh, pleural empyema and lung abscess. Authors and I have nothing to disclose. So as we all know, PPI are one of the most common prescribed drugs. However, they uh, cause so many side effects, including but not limited to uh, electrolyte disturbance, C. diff colitis, and uh, pneumonia. The pathogenesis behind the pneumonia, we believe that by prescribing PPI, we are suppressing the gastric acid 
and uh, thus uh, promoting bacterial proliferation, which leads to the development of pneumonia. So someone who's taking PPI is unable to clear the oropharyngeal uh, pathogens, and this is how they end up developing uh, pneumonia. However, there is no strict correlation between uh, the PPI use and the more serious lung infections such as lung abscess and pleural empyema. And this is how we start uh, looking at uh, finding one. So we conducted a retrospective uh, study based on a database, Explorers, uh, for, uh, we collected anonymous data from several hospitals in the United States. Patients were admitted between uh, 2018 and 2021. Uh, their age was 30 to 85. Uh, we have divided them into two groups, the control group, which are those who don't use PPI, and the uh, study group, which are PPI users. And we looked at the pre prevalence of uh, plural empyema and lung abscess among these two groups. Of course, we had so many um, uh, exclusion criteria, which are like uh, lung abscess and uh, uh, having history of empyema or lung uh, abscess. Uh, we conducted a univariate analysis and we looked at many uh, predictors, including age, gender, race, uh, having an immunosuppression Impressive conditions such as diabetes, being on uh, chemotherapy or HIV, of course, smoking, alcohol, and GERD. So this, uh, this table summarizes our findings. Uh, almost uh, 80 million uh, was our study sample. Uh, we divided them between PPI users and non-PPI users. The prevalence of uh, empyema or lung abscess was about uh, 7,000 uh, divided between those two groups, but the prevalence was uh, statistically uh, 10 times higher among uh, PPI users. So uh, PPR users were statistically at a higher risk of developing uh, lung abscess or pleural empyema with an odds ratio of 10. And uh, in PPI users, the predictors of having higher odds ratio were uh, older age, uh, smoking, uh, HIV, and uh, chemotherapy. So we conclude here in that um, PPI use is associated with higher prevalence of lung abscess and pleural empyema. However, uh, our study had so many limitations. Uh, being retrospective is number one. And uh, number two, it's a database. We couldn't look at the dose of PPI used, uh, nor at the duration of uh, PPI treatment. Uh, however, we were able uh, to highlight the side effects of these medication, and we invite you not to use them in the absence of a strong indication, especially in high-risk patients. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming here. So my name is Lee Seifer. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, Florida. I'm going to present my um, original uh, study and assessment on the etiology and treatment of pneumonia acquired in the ICU. As the title suggests, um, we'll be going through essentially all the hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonias that we diagnose in our three intensive care units in our hospital. So a little background, um, HAP and VAP is you know, a fairly common uh, hospital-acquired infection. In fact, it makes up 22% of all hospital-acquired infections with a particularly high mortality rate. Most studies cite that the mortality rate is above 30%. Um, for this reason, um, the 2016 guidelines published by IDSA and ATS uh, recommend that once HAP or VAP is, is you know, suspected uh, clinically, you should be prescribing empiric antibiotics because adequate empiric antibiotic therapy has been shown to decrease the mortality of such infections. Um, so with this in mind, um, we decided to create um, a study with two goals in mind. The first, um, I'll call it um, the first um, part of our study, was to essentially analyze all the organisms responsible for these HAP and VAPs and analyze their resistance patterns in order to create an antibiogram. And we created an antibiogram for each of our three intensive care units. Uh, the second arm of the study was to compare the mortality rates between different cohorts, which I will show you, um, based upon the empiric antibiotic given and the timing that it which, at which it was administered. 
So here's our methodology. So on the left side of the screen, you can see that we essentially looked at the EMR of all patients diagnosed with pneumonia in an ICU who also had positive respiratory cultures. From there, we um, used, with the help of an, of an infectious disease expert and going through the IDCA guidelines, we isolated all true HAP and VAPs um, per the guidelines and per the infectious disease um, help. And we use all, once we got the true HAP VAPs, we created an antibiogram, as you see on the bottom of the screen, for our three main ICUs, the MICU, the CICU, and our COVID ICU. The right side of the screen shows the second part of our study, which essentially will be from once we got all of our true HAP VAPs, we divided them into two main groups, patients who got adequate empiric antibiotics, meaning that the antibiotic they were given, um, the organism that was isolated was susceptible to the antibiotic that was empirically given. And so we created one group that was inadequately given and one group that was adequately given. And then in the adequate group, we subdivided them into timing of the antibiotics within 24 hours of diagnosis and after 24 hours of diagnosis. So I'll start with the gram positive results. The gram positives um, for our HAP VAP population was essentially all staph aureus. So we had one um, E. faecalis organism, but for the staph aureus, which is our most, you know, our area of focus, um, the findings were pretty much similar across the three ICUs. 50% of staph was MRSA, and 100% of the MRSAs were susceptible to vancomycin. This lends credence to the IDC recommendations that um, if you have a significant proportion of staph aureus isolates being MRSA, you should use vancomycin as an empiric choice. So that's that. For gram negatives, um, it was a little more interesting. Um, I will say, so I'm going to draw your attention here to the MICU section of this chart. So I have the complete antibiogram at the end of the presentation for reference, but I want to draw attention to pseudomonas and the gram negatives, particularly with um, respect to cefepime and cefepine and gentamicin. So in our MICU population, you, as you can see here, all gram negatives, um, in terms of all gram negatives, only are only... 71% of all gram negatives were susceptible to our once thought to be um, antibiotic of choice for HAP and VAP, cefepine, meaning that 29% of all gram negative HAP and VAPs were resistant to cefepine. Um, this lends credence to the IDSA guidelines that in an area or, or ICUs with high levels of resistance, you should be adding a second agent. And so our second agent, which we propose here using this antibiogram, adding cefepine, you can see how the um, susceptibilities, particularly of pseudomonas, do improve. Interestingly, at, you, you see in the COVID ICU, we did not have significant problems with gram-negative resistance, and the surgical ICU was a little bit um, better than the MICU. Um, of reference, meropenem was also very effective. So here's, a little, here's the second arm of the study, the results. So I'm going to draw your attention to the middle part of the screen here with true HAP and VAP. So we sifted through all these cases, and we came to 144 um, true HAP and VAP cases that we, you know, met criteria per the guidelines and were confirmed by our infectious disease experts. So with an overall mortality rate of 53%. Here in the two initial uh, subgroups, you have a mortality rate of 79% in patients who got inadequate antibiotic therapy versus a mortality rate of 46% in patients who receive adequate and period antibiotic therapy. That's expected, and that was statistically significant. However, the meat and the most interesting part of the study is this second sub-cohort of patients. So here in the cohort of patients who got adequate empiric antibiotics, when you divided them amongst patients who got them within 24 hours on the bottom and after 24 hours of diagnosis, you can see the mortality rates are extremely different. Um, the mortality rate of patients who got um, antibiotics within adequate antibiotics within 24 hours was 35% versus after 24 hours was 74%, and that was statistically significant. One more interesting component that I want to draw your attention to is that this mortality rate of 74% in adequate antibiotics after 24 hours was not statistically significant or not statistically different from patients who received inadequate antibiotics altogether. So this um, proportion, this finding really lends credence to the importance of adequate early empiric antibiotic therapy. So here I, I mentioned some of the discussion um, that really, you, yes, you know, having empiric antibiotic therapy is very important, um, but also the timing of when the antibiotic is prescribed is also more, more, very important. As you can see that the mortality rates have a uh, effect modifier based on time of initiation of antibiotics. Um, and this kind of lends its own credence to our other part of our study and the antibiogram, because now we know that if we want to give you know, adequate empiric antibiotic therapy, we probably should not be just giving cefepine and vancomycin. Um, 
And this confirms IDCA's you know, recommendations that um, hospitals can and should probably develop their own unique antibiogram um, to develop their adequate um, empiric therapy. And I have here the last question that I propose. Um, can we use these uh, antibiograms to tailor our empiric therapy and thus reduce mortality for patients suffering from half fat? Um, and that's where I will conclude my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Abdul Hamid al uh, I graduated from uh, School of Medicine at Jordan University of Science and Technology, and now I'm a postdoc research fellow at John Hopkins University. Uh, today at this presentation, I, will, I plan to share with you our experience at King Abdullah University Hospital, which is a tertiary hospital at the north of Jordan. Uh, with our experience uh, with mortality of uh, COVID-19 hospitalized patients. Uh, first of all, uh, I got this figure yesterday from, uh, from the website of uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, as you see, uh, COVID-19 pandemic since the beginning till yesterday, uh, there, were, there were more than 6.5 million uh, deaths have been recorded. So, as you, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has catastrophic uh, effects uh, uh, on our life, including high morbidity and mortality rates. Uh, for that, uh, as physicians, always uh, we, uh, we have questions from the patients, from COVID-19 patients or their relatives or friends that if I get infected with COVID-19, am I at higher risk for death or serious illness? Also, they ask, uh, they ask us about uh, the effectiveness of uh, therapeutic agents. Uh, before before two years, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, uh, we don't have answers to these questions. Uh, but now uh, we have uh, a piece of evidence about multiple risk factors associated with COVID-19 related death, including older age, being male, ethnicity, uh, that African Americans and uh, Asian people have more higher risk for death than white people, also sm uh, being a current smoker, uh, also the comorbidities including hypertension, DM, severe asthma, chronic cardiac or respiratory diseases, uh, these factors associated with higher risk for mortality. Uh, the comorbidities represented by uh, Charlson com comorbidity risk, which uh, when you have more comorbidities, you will score higher in, in this index for that, uh, and that means higher risk for death. Also, deprivation and other multiple factors. Uh, re uh, recently, researchers from uh, Johns Hopkins University have launched uh, a tool uh, used to estimate uh, the individual COVID-19 mortality risk for the general population. Uh, however, uh, most of these, uh, most of these uh, risk factors uh, have been proposed or uh, published based on studies conducted in the US, the UK, China, or other high-income developed countries. Uh, while uh, the evidence from, from middle or low-income countries, developing countries, is scarce. So, in this study, we aim uh, to fill this literature gap by describing the characteristics of patients hospitalized with COVID-19, identifying the risk factors associated with in-hospital COVID-19 related mortality. In this study, this study has a cross-sectional study design. It was conducted at King Abdullah University Hospital, which is a tertiary hospital in Jordan. In this study, the sample size consists of COVID-19 patients who were 18 years or older, 
hospitalized with evidence of pneumonia defined by radiological finding of uh, lung infiltrates, uh, required oxygen support at, uh, of, uh, for at least six liter per minute at any time during their hospitalization, and had elevated inflammatory markers. Uh, and uh, the patients uh, were hospitalized between September 26, 2020 to August 29, 2021. Uh, in this study, uh, we retrospectively uh, go through electronic medical records to collect uh, the sociodemographic and the clinical patients data. Uh, a total of 1,062 patients were uh, met the inclusion criteria and were included in this study. Uh, their mean age was uh, about 62 years. Uh, and uh, as you see in the figure, that uh, more than 92% of uh, the patients, of the hospitalized patients, were older than uh, 40. And approximately half uh, of the hospitalized patients uh, were older than uh, 65. Also, uh, about 62 of uh, our patients were men. Uh, regarding uh, the obesity, uh, about, uh, about 46, uh, 46 percentage of our patients were obese with BMI more than or equal 30. Also, about 87 uh, of our hospitalized patients had at least one comorbidity, including uh, hypertension and DM uh, uh, were the most common comorbidities, followed by anemia in one third of our patients, then asthma and uh, ischemic heart disease in about 18% of our uh, patients. Uh, also, other features of uh, our hospitalized patients included that 41% uh, of our patients need ICU admission. Uh, about one third of our patients need vasopressors use or, uh, and uh, non-invasive ventilation, CPAP or BiPAP. And about one quarter of our patients uh, were mechanically ventilated during their hospitalization. Uh, regarding the mortality rate, uh, as, as you see here in the figure, the mortality rate in, uh, was 44.8% as uh, 476 of uh, our patients uh, deceased. And uh, most, of our, most of the dead patients, about two thirds, uh, died uh, by, day, by day 14 of their hospitalization. Now, to assess the risk factors and the protectors for in-hospital mortality rate, uh, COVID-19 related, uh, we conducted a pioneer logistic regression analysis. Uh, the dependent vari variable in logistic regression uh, was being discharged alive from the hospital versus dead. Uh, regarding the independent ex explanatory va variables, uh, we included multiple variables, included socio-demographic characteristics, comorbidities, vital signs, radiological findings, and laboratory results at the time of admissions, complications during hospitalization, vasopressors use, also IC, the need for ICU admission, oxygen support categories during hospitalization, including non-invasive ventilation or, or mechanical ventilation, and therapeutic regimens. All of these uh, variables were included in the, in the model. And after that, we conducted a stepwise backward uh, approach to, uh, with, a, with a cut of uh, point uh, P value of less than or equal 0 0.2. Uh, to finally, to, to reach uh, the fittest, uh, the most, the most um, uh, reflected uh, model of the independent variables. Uh, after conducted the logistic regression, uh, we have this uh, forest plot. Forest plot, uh, this uh, figure uh, represents the, pre the predictors for in-hospital mortality. As we see here, uh, uh, this, uh, this plot uh, depends on odds ratio, adjusted odds ratio, represented by the, uh, the, blue, the blue circles. Also, uh, the 95 percent confidence interval. As you see here, that the odds ratio more than one, so it's associated with higher risk of mortality. Uh, but when the odds ratio less than one, 
the reference line one, uh, then it associated with reduction in mortality. So from the figure, we, uh, we find that the age, cigarette smoking and comorbidities, hypertension, DM, ischemic heart disease, anemia, renal failure, and having active cancer, all of these were associated with higher risk of mortality. Also, at the time of admission, patients with hypoxia, hypernatremia, and bilateral lung infiltrates were also at higher, at higher risk for death. During hospitalization, development of pneumothorax, DKA, or arrhythmia, also they were associated with higher risk for death. Uh, also, uh, vasopressors use the need for non-invasive ventilation, including uh, CPAP or BiPAP, and use of invasive mechanical ventilation, and the need for ICU admission were associated with higher risk for death. Uh, among these risk factors, uh, we noticed that invasive mechanical ventilation, vasopressors use, uh, were associated with the highest odds ratio for the in-hospital mortality risk, followed by uh, having developing new pneumothorax during uh, hospitalization and having hypernatremia at the time of admission. These four factors were the most significant risk factors for death. At the other side, the use of uh, triple therapy, combination of tesluzumab, remidesvir, and dexamethasone was associated with a reduction in, uh, in risk for mortality among hospitalized COVID-19 patients. For that, uh, we, can, we, we can conclude that the in-hospital mortality risk could be expected based on the clinical parameters of the hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Also, these reported risk factors could be, uh, could be used to stratify the patients with COVID-19 and resource allocation. Also, uh, such therapeutic regimens uh, as uh, the, use of the use of triple therapy, uh, tocilizumab, remidesvir with uh, dexamethasone, may, have, uh, may improve outcomes. Thank you all. Iron deficiency part to Dr. Yusuf. By the way, my name is Dr. Yusuf too. <laughs> so we're speaking to each other. Uh, is there a discrimination between the degree of iron deficiency? Does it matter, uh, you know, how severe? I, I don't think so. I heard you tell us how bad was the iron deficiency. Was there any discrimination in good versus worse uh, with replacement? Yeah, so that's the weakness in our study. There is actually, it's an administrative database, so we really cannot account for how much, uh, how iron deficient the patient was, and we can only know if the patient is iron deficient or not, because due to with the way they code with, it, with the ICD-10 code, so really not sure how iron deficient they are. Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Seifer. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Um, so for um, cefepim, I think the reason for using that over um, vancomycin and zosin would be t for renal protection. So I was wondering if you had any information on the addition of gentamicin and the um, renal effects versus um, mm -hmm. papercillin tazobactone. Um, Hello. Uh, to answer your question briefly, uh, we didn't, we haven't looked at um, rates of AKIs yet in the study. But however, I will mention that Zosin was not more effective in our um, two years in, the, in our in our in the two years that we study in our ICU. Zosin did not cover more organisms than cefepime. In fact, cefepime had higher coverage than Zosin. So that was kind of um, reinstated why we prefer cefepime over Zosin. So, um, yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's, still far away. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Dr. Sahar Al Baroudi. I'm probably the only pediatric pulmonologist in the room. Um, great talks for all of you guys. I had a question about the um, PPI study. 
I think that was yeah, you. That's my um, Perfect. You might have mentioned this already, but did you guys correct for um, how sick the patients are in terms of respiratory support, i.e. what level of ventilatory support, what kind of tidal volume species they're receiving, or just overall ventilated versus on room air, obviously. And then I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the pathophysiology of why you think the um, PPI is related to a worse outcome. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, regarding the first part, uh, we didn't uh, follow the patient in terms of uh, their oxygen requirement. Like we didn't uh, classify them between uh, room air or uh, uh, requiring an IV or mechanical ventilation. And uh, we think that uh, PPI, as I said before, uh, like promote uh, oropharyngeal bacteria to grow. And uh, this is how uh, patients at higher risk, maybe they are ending up having uh, infections such as uh, lung abscess or empyema uh, because they don't clear their uh, oral microbiota uh, as someone else uh, does. I think it may be helpful to look into um the respiratory status at the time. It may be a just a specific practice in our hospital, but pretty much everybody that's NPO because they're acute respiratory failure intubated, ventilated, they're on some kind of either H2 blocker or PPI. So it'd be kind of nice to see if we correct for those and you still see the differences. Yes, of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I, I want to pause for questions. We actually have Dr. Sheikh, our last presenter, uh, who just came to us from a different session. So I want to give him the opportunity uh, to present on his work on the CFTR. Um, on cystic fibrosis. Hi guys, thank you for the opportunity. Sorry, I was uh, doing two things at the same time, so got a little late. Uh, this is our uh, study on uh, impact of the CFTR modulator therapy, uh, by, uh, which comes with a ETI therapy or trikafta uh, on the uh, bacterial colonization and inflammation in cystic fibrosis. My name is uh, Shahid Sheikh. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Ohio State University and Nationwide Children's Hospital and uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And we are hoping that we're gonna have our first uh, snow next week. <laughs> Having said that, this study was uh, sponsored by the uh, Ohio State University C Cure CF uh, Group and the CF Foundation Research Grants. There is no potential conflict of interest and no financial relationship with anyone uh, to disclose. CF, as we know, is a multi-system disease with progressive deterioration. Uh, recently, CFTR modulator therapies are introduced, which have, can repair the underlying protein defect, at least to some extent. But the relationship between the abnormal CFTR function or CFTR modulator therapies with either inflammation or infection is still not very well understood. Uh, objective of this study was to determine that if the CFTR modulators, ETI in brief, uh, this therapy improves the clinical indicators, decreases the bacterial colonization, and improves the inflammation as uh, measured by the systemic cytokine levels and the circulating immune cell populations in patients with CF. We hypothesize that it does. Uh, we had about 48 patients with cystic fibrosis who were enro enrolled from our uh, center during the initiation of their ETI, ETI therapy. We also recruited 20 healthy controls without CF uh, to compare. IRB was obtained. Demographics and clinical parameters were collected at the time of the initiation of the study and every three months for a total of one year. Blood was analyzed at baseline at, at six months for cytokines and, and immune cell populations in patients with CF. And it was also collected from non-CF controls. Uh, we did the, took the means. Uh, got the percent changes from baseline, did uh, independent of the pair T test or Wilcoxon signed rank test depending upon the uh, type of the uh, data. And uh, our in sim simply to, sim to uh, simply mention the result, the sample size was 48, mean age was 
28, there was significant improvement in person predicted FEV1 and BMI. They both correlated very well. At three months, the mean sweat chloride decreased from 97 to 48 within one month. There was significant reduction in pseudomonal and MRSA positivity in the patient with CF with uh, ETI therapy and significant reduction in the cytokines. Now, to have a little bit more detailed uh, uh, results, uh, mean FEV1 at baseline was 63%, which at three months improved to 71%, which was about 13% improvement, and this, which was significant, and this improvement persisted uh, for throughout the 12 month of uh, study. Similarly, BMI was about 22 at baseline, improved by around 4.5% at three months, and the per improvement persisted throughout the one year study. We had about uh, 52% uh, of the uh, patients who were positive for pseudomonas at baseline, at one year uh, with ETI therapy, they were down to 25%, so there was at about 50% reduction in the positivity of uh, pseudomonas in the sputum cultures, which was significant. Similarly, MRSA cultures were patient, about 44% of the patient had a positive MRSA culture and colonization at the initiation of the ETI at one year, it was reduced to 27%, which was about 37% reduction, which was also significant. When we looked at the, uh, among those who were or were not uh, colonized with pseudomonas at baseline at, at six months, and look at the number of cytokines, including TH1s, TH2s, TH13, uh, uh, IL-17, and so on, there was no significant difference between those who had a pseudomonal colonization versus those who had no pseudomonal colonization either at baseline or after six months of ETI therapy. S similarly, we looked at those who were colonized with MRSA. Uh, those who had a MRSA colonization at uh, baseline had a higher IL-6 and higher IL-17A uh, uh, cytokine levels, which uh, compared to those who had no MRSA colonization. But with six months therapy with ETI or trikefta, that uh, sig significance or difference was lost. When we compared the patient with CF to the controls, we noted that the pa patients without CF, which were controlled, had a lower level of IL-6-8 and IL-17-A and higher level of IL-13. Uh, after six months therapy with the ETI, the IL-6-8 and IL-17 level significantly decreased in patients with CF, but they were still higher than uh, those without CF. When we look at the immune cell populations, we notice that compared to those without CF, patients with CF had uh, higher neutrophils and lower uh, CD3 positive uh, T cells, CD4 positive T cells, CD8 positive T cells, and also uh, CD19 positive B cells and NK cells and uh, dendritic cells. But with six months therapy uh, with the ETI, most of these cell numbers did increase, though they were still a little lower than the uh, patients without, uh, uh, without CF. Uh, the, uh, one interesting thing we noticed that the, the eosinophil count significantly improved with the ETI therapy and that we have no uh, reason or uh, association because none of them had any allergic reaction to the medication. When we look at those who had a positive or negative blast fungal cultures and look at the different cytokine levels, we found out that those who had positive fungal cultures had lower IL-17A compared to those who did not. After ETI, six months of ETI therapy, the difference was still significant but was much less in, in their means. Now, do uh, uh, IL-17A somehow inhibit fungal colonization, or do the fungal colonization inhibit uh, IL-17-related mechanism? It's very premature to speculate, but I think this is something we are, which we can look in the future studies. Now, in con conclusion, in patients with CF, with the ETI or trikefta therapy, uh, there is a significant improvement in FEV1 and mean BMI. There's a significant decrease in sweat chloride, 
and therapy was associated with decreases in pseudomolar and MRSA colonization, and it partially restored the systemic cytokine production and circulating immune cell population. And I'll end over here, and thank you very much for your patience. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's return to questions. Um, yes, perfect. Can I ask a quick question about that? So you said your trauma from Mayo Clinic. I just, for your colonization, so at baseline, of course, they were probably producing sputum. After initiation of protein modulators, how did you collect your samples? Because we're using posterior pharyngeal swabs. I, I think at the initiation of... Let me just make sure. Um, at, the, at the initiation of the therapy, about... 80 to 90 percent of the patients were using sputa. I think by, uh, uh, by the end of the therapy, about 80 to 90 percent were, uh, were, we were getting it from the source, uh, throat swabs because they were not producing sputum at all. So did that collection, had some kind of a bias in a collection or was it possible that with the clearance of the airway secretions, their, uh, what we call it, their their CF bronchiectasis was changing into a non-CF bronchiectasis, which was uh, uh, culture negative, and, uh, and that's why there was nothing left over there to come. It is yet to be seen. Uh, it's premature to say, but all we can say is that there was less and less patients who were uh, showing any kind of a uh, positive culture with the time. And in most of them, we were able, even able to discontinue the vest and chest therapies and most of the other therapies. So. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other questions? Could I have a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> to Dr. Rafael Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, uh, regarding, like, at the, uh, when the participant got a question, like, uh, the reasons for vaccine ref uh, refusal. Mm -hmm. Uh, the choices show up for, for the participant or, and he chose for, for among them or what? So um, it was all on red caps and so there were different um, charts that they had and so the, they could choose one in each row of um, what they thought, you know, if, if the reasons for refusal, if this was, a, you know, very likely that this was a high reason for refusal or this was, you know, somewhat a refusal. So they had to choose one of the options and then each different option for refusal, they had to rate uh, or choose, you know, an answer choice on was this very likely to be a um, contributor to vaccine refusal or, and then, so each one they had an option to choose. What did you get the choices? Um, so these were all validated studies. Um, there's a okay. couple of authors that have put out. So um, the SAGE group, um, which is like a CDC and WHO group, they have some validated studies. So we used that and adapted some other ones, I think Cataldi et al. Um, and then we added a couple others. So there were some questions that um, brought in different factors on race as well. And those were um, external sources, but everything was externally validated by the pre-existing yeah. studies and we just adapted them and everything was um, iteratively um, so, uh, vetted by our experts. Yeah. So, awesome. Thank yeah. you. So, Thank you. As a follow-up to that, um, you identified the, the attitudes and the hesitancy. So is there an action plan that mm -hmm. you propose the audience take home as we go into a new flu season and how to educate our patients? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Thank you. So I think that, you know, one of the, uh, there's a couple things that we can do, right? So I think utilizing our um, EMRs to the best of our ability because, you know, we're all human, right? And so it's hard to keep track and our EMRs are brilliant. And so we need to utilize our EMRs to the best of our ability. And so we need to have electronic alerts that alert us as providers during each and every appointment as also to alert our colleagues that are helping to room the patients because I think that's a, a key time when you can act on that. Um, and the nurse or whoever is rooming the patient can start that discussion and then we can continue it. Also sending out um, reminders to patients. And then I know that um, at least in our health system and I think in many health systems across the country during COVID, we really initiated this um, ability for patients to self-schedule their vaccine appointments. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a key thing that we can do because if we're allowing patients to choose a time that works for them, it, it just opens up so many doors, right? And so otherwise they have to get on the phone, they're on hold forever, then they finally get 
get the appointment. It's hard. So I think that we need to be able to make it easier for patients, have you know long periods of time where they can go get their vaccines, have them easily available at their workplace, um, long hours, you know, have mobile vaccine clinics. These are actionable things that we can do to help increase it. And then, of course, if we as providers are actually having these conversations with our patients, I think we've we've shown time and time again that that is a key you know reason that people choose to get their vaccines. We're people trust us, right? We, and so we have to use that to the best of our ability to promote healthy behavior. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I just want to iterate that advances in management of bacteria, I mean, infections, and we're back to vaccines, right? That's been the, the time tested on preventing um, infections. So thank you for yeah. that work. So any final comments, uh, questions for the panel? Well, then, thank you so much.